Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Same, same uh, here. And I'm sorry I'm joining so late, but I'm actually at another meeting, but made sure I had a time to come out and join you. And I'm sure a lot of things have been said before and solutions proffered, but we'd like to have some input on that as well and in this important effort. So we will address the status and the trajectory of uh, care and providing care in clinical rheumatology in the terms of trainees and suggest what we think could be adapted by others, best practices for outreach, recruitment and retention. Um, I think it must have been said earlier and I'm sure everyone is well aware of the benefits of diversity. It increases access to quality care for everybody. And that's so important regardless of the social determinants of health but it broadens the medical landscape and supports institutional excellence. And we try to do that where we work. But you heard about DEI, it advances cultural competence and also enhances education across the curriculum. I'm sure numbers have been shared with all of you about uh, the workforce issue and it's likely to worsen with projections uh, for the next 40 years looking dire and the white population in America is decreasing while underrepresented uh, individuals increase, mostly the Hispanics, but also Asians, and Blacks remaining stable at about 13%. And most of the data we have actually on black, is on Black physicians. And over the past 120 years, the percent of Black physicians in relation to the representation in the population hasn't really um, worked or uh, expanded, and there's a decline in numbers of male physicians as well. Physicians as well, and most of them are more black females that have joined the workforce. So overall, decrease in numbers. So the next slide actually shows that we shouldn't be surprised at these numbers because at the source it is similar as well. And when we look at the review of uh, medical decrees granted over the past 30 years, whereas the female uh, enrollment has doubled, mainly due to Asian increase, about 12%. The male enrollment has in fact declined, and most of this is in the white population, but there continues to be underrepresentation of Blacks, Hispanics, and Native Americans well below their census um, percentages. And that's unchanged, sadly, over the past 80 years. Uh, Dr. Dahl, you're the medical student preceptor at Howard University where there are many underrepresented. I think maybe she's frozen. We were just talking about the fact that at Howard, we have a probably a very sort of different view because we certainly see a, a lot of underrepresented minorities in our, in our setting. Um, so in terms of diversity, it's a, 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 most of our, our, our students are diverse students. Um, we have seen an increase in the class sizes and in the number of students. So I do believe that we have seen increased enrollment. Um, and despite the numbers in general, we clearly have a very diverse cohort. But as Dr. Carr alluded to, um, the need for diversity is still there. Um, we haven't grown as much as we would like to grow. I do think that since the Black Lives Matter movement, we've seen a lot more sensitivity to structural race, racism with the recognition that there is a group in society who didn't make it, not because they couldn't, but because there were barriers that were there that they could not cross or could not transcend. Um, and with that, I do believe that there is more of a push as we're seeing here in this conference, right? In the, all the wonderful, ideas and all of the wonderful grants that are, are being proposed that there is more push to try our very best to transcend some of these, bar these barriers. So there is a direct impact of this therefore in the next slide on our specialty. And I remember looking at these, uh, these uh, graphs before when I joined uh, the rheumatology specialty and there was alarm in 2005 when it's much worse now because of the divergence between demand and supply. And there's a continued separation and a projection in the next 10 years, and really a cause for alarm that not only is there that of a reduced workforce, but achieving that diversity, which we're trying to address today, will be an even greater challenge. So it appears that we have a 
problem and a crisis with this. And it's sort of a crib to grieve phenomenon that we're seeing right across the spectrum. So we're here to discuss ways to fortify the pipeline to feed the diversity. But is there, Dr. Dahl, really a need for this? Does it matter to have this diversity in our specialty? I believe so. Um, I think it's all very compelling that there are several studies, not just this one that we are highlighting here, that show that ethnic minority patients prefer ethnic minority healthcare providers. Um, this is just one study that can demonstrate the benefit of having a healthcare provider that you trust and that can relate to you. And so I do think it's extremely important that patients can see or have the option to see doctors and to choose doctors that they feel that they can relate better to. Um, the, the default really has been to look at the historically black institutions as being um, responsible for training of most of the ethnic minority physicians. Um, but there is a bit of a history to this. Dr. Carr can probably allude to that a little bit more. Yeah, there is, because, you know, it's the HBCUs, as they're coined, is where Blacks, for which we have most of the data that are more, more likely to seek training, acceptance, and successful admission. And yes, there is a history. And in order to move forward, we have to understand that. So making no assumptions here, allow me to delve into that, because of what we speak, there is a beginning. And uh, back in the day during segregation, remember Blacks were banned from attending any so sort of graduate training, especially in the South and discouraged from seeking it in the North. And the HBCUs were created to accommodate these cadre of people and with success. And they provided training for about 75% of Black doctorate degrees and about 80% of all the Black federal judges at the time. Then came the move to standardize medical schools, and there was a need to do so. And the person charged with this, you've often heard of the Flexner Report, but Abraham Flexer was an individual. And he actually went around and visited all existed 155 medical schools at the time. There were 13 Black medical schools as listed here in these locations. And it's the model we follow today, where you have a preclinical and a clinical school uh, years of training and that medical schools should be attached to universities. But it required resources to follow those recommendations. But Flexner had some more comments to make. And one of them was that he in fact closed half of the medical schools generally. So that automatically decreased the amount of physicians produced then and probably now. And also he, um, suggested that many of the black schools were subpar. And even though at the time these graduates were providing care to black individuals and also to rural whites, those schools didn't have the funding to follow his recommendations. Others did, the white schools, the Rockefeller, et cetera, gave them the funding to meet those stringent requirements. When the match program or the, sorry, the medical school application process came in 1923, they also required resources in order to reach that benchmark. So they couldn't. And it wasn't until 1966 with the Civil Rights Act that they were allowed to enter into medical schools. So you're talking about 70 years impact on the workforce. So in the next slide, you'll see what was proposed could have happened if there were measures made to continue some of those training schools. Um, uh, I think this yeah. is something that's important to pause and ponder on just a little bit, right? If you can imagine if those medical schools had not disappeared or been disappeared, I mean, it's a sobering thought. Um, today, given the increased diverse enrollment in all school, I think it's still possible to improve our numbers, but. This is something to really reflect on. Right, so the result in about a 30% decrease in what we have available today. So, but here we are in the here and now, and then there are four. So um, a lot of times to solve this diversity uh, chasm, I as a cast on the HBCUs to say, well, train your folks, fill the gap, but can they? So the next slide shows 
what I was able to find out. And uh, last year, I actually called up the four existing HBCU medical schools um, to ask them what steps they had taken as far as outreach to supply the pipeline. And individuals listed here were gracious enough to share their experiences. The first one is Charles Drew, which is the newest of the four in South Central LA Watts region it serves. And their aim really is to train diverse students who have demonstrated though, we spoke about the holistic approach. They accept students who aim to uh, serve disadvantaged and underserved populations. Uh, the school has had some financial uh, struggles, but it's rebuilding and it has a new program, which they expanded last year in July 2021. Still a small program, but quite diverse. Most of their uh, uh, students are citizens, 90%. They don't have a rheumatology faculty. And the rheumatology exposure, as is for other specialties, is at the Long Beach VA Medical Center and University Irvine, where they get some didactic lectures. As of now, because it's new, they don't have any rheumatology applicants. Morehouse, on the other hand, is a large program, about 81 residents, mostly black and uh, mostly US citizens, but earlier on, they had uh, non-citizens. And they too are without rheumatology faculty. And their residents go uh, ambulatory uh, rotation at Emory just two half days a week. And even then it's space permitting. It isn't a given that it will occur each week. Their focus again is to produce black primary care physicians, but some candidates have been successful at applying for other specialties. But uh, on recall, they could think of only two people that went to rheumatology fellowship. And then there is Mahari in Tennessee, which has about 85% um, African-American. The majority are US citizens because the, the juggernaut that it is to deal with visa applications, they've stayed away for it. And again, they don't have a rheumatology faculty, but has built an alliance with Vanderbilt. And there it's a crosstalk. The Vanderbilt folks go over to the Nashville General Hospital to do a half day clinic per week and do the infusion clinic. But the Mahari residents do not attend Vanderbilt or go to the VA rheumatology clinic. Again, because of a space challenge. And most of their individuals go to hospitals, their IUD, and nobody uh, really thought of anyone going into rheumatology. We can speak, however, to the Howard experience, which is the next slide. And that is the oldest of the four HBCUs. The, and we believe from this, you can probably have a template for outreach and recruitment. Their class, uh, applying the same parameters, 81, mostly black, 10% South Asian. And they have probably about 20, 30% US citizens. The rest are mainly permanent residents. Uh, more recently, we've had a staff of about 2.1 and most of them go off. This is a difference between them and the others. Most of them actually go off into specialty fellowship programs. And before 2008, there was one rheumatologist on staff there for 40 years, and they had an accredited program briefly and produced four rheumatologists during that time period. Uh, we went in in about 2008, and we made some changes, and it involved really integration and engagement. And this is what we designed. The next slide shows that uh, we, uh, offered the following, and that as for cardiology, we insisted on having two residents rotate with us per month. And in the 15 plus years, this commitment has not wavered actually. Initially, we took third year residents, um, but then the residents gave feedback and said, you know, at the time when you applied for fellowships, then during the second year, it switched back recently but they wanted the option to apply now to rheumatology. So they wanted the exposure earlier. So we started taking secondary individuals and we had four, not one or two, but four outpatient clinics per week split between Howard and the VA. Um, and they had an inpatient and outpatient schedule. 
They had didactic lectures, both by them and the attending, X-ray conference with the fellows, and also participation with the EBIM uh, questions. And that was reflected in the in-service where they scored very high in rheumatology going forward. We also paid tribute to the individual who was there for the 40 years, Kenneth Austin. And we have an annual rheumatology symposium in the city we're the only academic institution that has a rheumatology meeting each year, and the residents vie for the slot to present at that meeting a clinical difficult case uh, with the audience. Because of this engagement over the past 14, how many years, we've ended up feeding into that pipeline of about 13 rheumatology fellows. And these are the institutions to which they were accepted. Uh, they have been productive. And I have to update this slide. We have a little bit more, but they did abstracts and publications. And at the time of completion of their fellowship training, uh, at least five went into academia. Five were female. But Dr. Dow, only one was a US citizen. And I'm judging from the recent applicants I've been seeing over the past few years, and most of them are international medical graduates. Are these things that are going to clog our pipeline? Well, as an IMG myself, <laughs> I don't think so. Um, I think we, we have a lot of evidence to show that IMGs constitute about 50% of the rheumatology fellowship <laughs> applications in any given year. And what is what is good about being an IMG is that they're often of diverse ethnic groups, multilingual, and they have a high interest in working with ethnic groups, with underrepresented minorities. Um, they also have a really high interest in working with eliminating health disparities and serving under, underserved areas. For instance, for me, Howard was an opportunity to sort of come home to serve a community that I was familiar with and to make a difference um, for a patient who I really can connect with, the Afro-Caribbean, the African, the, you know, so it really does, it really does seem as if IMGs tend to work in this area. Now, part of this obligation may be based on visa requirements, because in order to stay in the U.S., there is often a waiver that has to be done where you work in an underserved area, but I do think that the, the interest in serving the underserved is real and giving back to that community that you relate to. What is sad is that only about 80% of the IMGs that we treat actually remain to practice in the US. And this is often due to barriers with immigration and visas and also lack of opportunity for what we consider to be preferred work. Um, this is especially if you want to do academic work or research. Um, after completing fellowship, there are very few opportunities in academic practice that would provide a path to citizenship for IMGs. And also there's a limited opportunities to do, you know, the research work that's really respected um, due to a lack of citizenship. And that leads to less publications and also uh, an attenuated sort of career path. So this, I think this lack of self-actualization, this loss of autonomy in terms of the direction where your career can go, and also this work in high volume clinical care areas means that we may have higher burnout and a desire probably to leave and, and follow a less tortuous path. But I think if we could find a way to retain IMGs and increase our pipeline for training of diverse US students and residents, um, that we would be in a really good position. So there's a challenge. So if we could uh, suggest adaptation of this powered model for individuals, improving their interest, engaging them in training, then I think that certainly opens the possibilities for these applicants. Um, what about the relationships? Is that important too? That is extremely important. I think that's one of the things that really allows this to work. Um, what you didn't mention, which I will say now to every, anyone who is willing to have one of our residents come out to do an elective is that we actually have three or four internal medicine residents right now who want to do rheumatology. Um, and so we're looking to get them experiences outside of Howard as well, where they can get 
a better perspective of what this work would look like. So please email me, contact me afterwards, because we'd like to find ways for them to go out and experience more rheumatology as well. But the residents who have gone into fellowship, um, they provide great resources for those who, are, who have an interest or who are entering the application cycle. We stay in contact, we're very collegial, and they, they volunteer and provide advice to their colleagues and um, begin to pave the way for the current applicants as well. And the word spreads. And the word spreads, yes. Um, I think ultimately though, even with improving interests and improving applications for fellowship, there is still much that can be done to attract and retain a diverse rheumatology cohort. Um, training and education need support and funding. And many of you today have presented, you know, many of our panelists today have presented, you know, amazing and really innovative ways to do this. And I was really pleased to hear about all that is happening in this space. Um, one bar major barrier to retention is financial. You don't often want to like say it, but it is there. Unfortunately, when you think about it, many of our underrepresented uh, minority students and internal medicine residents, they really have high education debts. And beyond that, because we all have that, they also have obligations to relatives, which they feel pressure to meet. Um, a lot of us, you know, can probably don't, don't feel as obligated to support family members who have not attended college, but a lot of, a lot of our residents, you know, really have these high familial obligations. And so they feel the urgency to earn, which can often be achieved immediately after residency, as opposed to spending an additional two to three years of training. Um, I really had to speak like at length to one of our recent happily um, fellows because before applying to fellowship, that was one of the things that was really concerning to him. Um, you know, he has a family, he has a mom who is sick, and you know, how would he be able to support them during fellowship, even though he really wanted to do um, rheumatology. So I think the idea that Dr. Carr actually posited here of high income fellowships <laughs> um, and funding and support for early career faculty um, would go a long way to helping us to recruit and retain um, those fellows, fellows and faculty as well. And I'll also go on to say that there's something that we really have to think about because if we have, when it comes to academia, if we don't have the rheumatology faculty present, especially at the HBCUs, as we mentioned before, many of which do not have a rheumatology rotation or faculty present within the schools, then that means that there is not a lot of research mentorship occurring in rheumatology. So we cannot really expect the HBCUs to be at the forefront of research mentorship um, for underrepresented minorities in medicine. And that means that we do need collaboration with mentors at large to ensure that we have adequate training and grant support and time to do that, um, that residents or the fellows know or the new faculty know how to apply for funds and how to have publications, how to get that research all the way through the different portions into publication, um, and therefore also to develop that career in, um, in research as well. And it's, it's not hard to, because we have a lot of data that really support this, we can think, think back to what we know are known measures of success to see why this is really important. For instance, we know that with NIH, you know, this research showed that there is really a bias in funding research applications submitted by underrepresented minorities. Um, the R01, which is the oldest and the most common grant mechanism used by NIH, provides about four to five years of funding for health-related research and development. And it's really a, a, a goal for many fa um, young faculty or early career faculty to get one of these grants. But approximately 71% of these grants go to white men and applications from white PIs are about two times more likely to receive funding than applications from black PIs. And this often happens due to the topic choice as well, where the work that we do in terms of diversity and equity and inclusion, which is really one of the preferred topics is not as is seen as highly funded. 
So ultimately, when I think about retention, I really think it goes back to the softer skills. I put this slide in because um, this is like a tongue in cheek look at some of the, the many mottos that we have for our institutions in healthcare. Um, and this is for, from some of the prominent institutions in DC, but I feel as if we need to live up to these mottos, not just for patient care, but for caring for our faculty and our staff as well. If we were to treat our faculty well, provide administrative support for tasks, clinical support for the busy work, I mean, you all know what that is, like considering the use of scribes and prior authorization support, these things that really burn a lot of time and don't really add to the joy of doing medicine, um, have like intermittent assessments of workload and understand the always of work involved, especially for those early career faculty who are the eager beavers and say yes to everything so that we can ensure that they're not on a path to burnout and fatigue. We should also build in like mental health days and time, support for engaging in physical exercise while at work, convenience for childcare, just the things to show that we value the health, mental and physical of the faculty that work within academia. And also we need to prioritize their wealth as well. So I think um, we really need to look at, um, at research and academia and make sure we have reasonable compensation and benefits for the work that is being done with transparency across the board. And there needs to be an investment in developing our people so that there is mentorship, protected time that is honored for academic scholarship, clear promotion paths and career coach services and opportunities for leadership that are really available to all. I really think overall that an institutional culture of caring and mutual respect, not just for patients, but for staff and faculty can help to retain um, faculty in academia. I know Dr. Carr that you also had a couple of ideas on this as well. Well, I ran this by some people this week um, telling them what we're trying to do. And some of them are pretty passionate. And also they spoke about the burnout, et cetera. And all too often, uh, underrepresented individuals are given the title at some institutions with the expectation to solve the DEI issue. And it's often not supported in any way by administration nor compensation and their workload has not been adjusted either. So that's another problem as well. And sometimes that underrepresented individual could serve the cause in other ways. It doesn't have to be a designated DEI position. It could be patient education sessions. It could be the occasional visit to a high school to influence someone to go into science because the problem is even deeper than we speak today. And then another person indicated, you know, when you have the expectations of being the only person in the specialty on a faculty, um, things are said sometimes which are subconscious, unintended, and can you call a friend to discuss the situation with them? They thought that that would be helpful because, again, a lot of times it's not intended, the person doesn't know, and how do you approach that, how you can sensitize the person and move on from that, so that's good, I think. Because they have not been experienced often from the school that they came from, especially with the HBCU, they may not have most likely been exposed to any research opportunities. And maybe there should be some program that if in their academics, they have a 101 on research and go from there. And I think, you know, one way to help keep them enthusiastic and uh, help retention is to have some early hits and successes in that area to so as to whet their appetite to keep them as well. And of course, as you said, to have regular debriefings with them to hear what they're doing and how they think uh, things can be better. I think all those are, are really um, important thoughts as well. I particularly love the idea of having, of being able to call a friend. <laughs> Um, in a situation where it's a little bit sensitive and you would like some outside advice as well, because it can be, I think, very lonely as, as 
as a underrepresented minority faculty to know who to go to and who to speak to. 